buenas tardes y bienvenidos a un nuevo Virtual Investment Summit de Fund Society. Hoy vamos a hablar con Jupiter Asset Management sobre las perspectivas del oro y la plata, en un escenario en el que la tendencia al alza de la inflación parece que se confirma. Eh, por otro lado, vamos a hablar cómo la inversión en este tipo de activos puede ser muy beneficioso y pueden jugar un papel muy importante en una cartera bien diversificada. Antes de presentaros a mi primer invitado que está con nosotros en el estudio, quiero recordar a nuestros oyentes que pueden hacer preguntas durante todo el evento. Hay dos maneras de hacerlo, a través de la sección de Q&A de, de la plataforma de Webex o simplemente podéis mandar un email a info.fansociety.com. Las preguntas pueden ser en inglés o en español. Y como decía, eh, hoy nuestro primer invitado ha venido a, a estar aquí en, en el estudio de Fan Society, eh, Félix de Gregorio, eh, Head of Iberia de, de Jupiter. Muchísimas gracias por estar aquí. Muchas gracias a ti, Elena. Y, y nada, cuando quieras. Muy bien, pues buenas tardes a todos. Muchas gracias al, al, al equipo de Fan Society por la organización de este Virtual Investment Summit. Eh, en primer lugar, quería eh, presentar a, a los dos panelistas que nos acompañan en el evento de hoy. José María es eh, responsable global de análisis y selección de fondos de Santander Banca Privada. Buenas tardes, José María. Sí. ¿Me oís? Sí, sí. buenas tardes, José María. Y Álvaro, eh, Álvaro Martín Sauto. Eh, Álvaro es eh, director de inversiones de fondos de fondos, eh, eh, renta fija y garantizados en Bankia Asset Management. Buenas tardes, eh, Álvaro, y bienvenido. Y, y a continuación, por supuesto, pues eh, presentar a, al protagonista más importante de hoy, a Ned Naylor Leyland. Voy a hacer la presentación, voy a pasar a inglés y, y ya eh, tendremos el resto del evento en este, en este idioma. Uh, Ned uh, is uh, Jupiter's uh, um, head of uh, strategy for gold and silver and uh, the manager of. Uh, Hola, muy buenas tardes, Félix. Buenas tardes, Ned. I was saying that uh, uh, Ned is the uh, manager of a quite unique uh, uh, fund. Uh, Ned joined the company in 2015. Uh, he uh, has more than two decades uh, of experience in uh, precious metals investing. He, um, having founded uh, a dedicated monetary metals fund back in 2009 at uh, Quilter Cheviot, uh, he graduated from Bristol University uh, uh, back in 1998 with a BA in Spanish, although I insist that the rest of the event will be uh, held in English. I, I just said that the, uh, the, the fund is uh, quite unique. And one of the reasons uh, for that uh, is uh, that it, it not only invests in gold, but also in silver. Uh, silver is, uh, along gold, of course, a, a monetary metal, but it also has a wide uh, industrial use. In fact, uh, it is estimated that between 60 and 70 percent of the annual production of silver uh, goes to the uh, to different industries, among which uh, we have some uh, very uh, intimately related to the, to, to the so-called green economy. And that is because silver is a critical uh, element in the manufacturing of solar panels in electrification, uh, purification of water, and, and, and many other things. And that growing industrial use, uh, uh, I think, makes silver uh, a very uh, interesting and, uh, and uh, special uh, uh, asset to, to consider. Uh, and I also thought that I would share a fact which uh, was very surprising to me about gold. Uh, and that fact is that uh, the average daily Uh, traded volume uh, worldwide uh, for gold is uh, above $200 billion. That uh, incredible figure, uh, I think, speaks for itself about the importance of gold in the, in the current uh, financial markets. Estamos eh, teniendo un, po un, un pequeño problema con la conexión de, de NED mientras reconecta. No sé si a lo mejor queréis explicarnos un poco... Eh, bueno, ¿cuál es vuestra visión y cómo, si, estáis, si consideráis este tipo de, de activos eh, en vuestras carteras? 
y tenéis un poco una idea de cuál podría ser la, el papel que pueden jugar? Bueno, desde luego eh, la respuesta a tu pregunta es que sí los consideramos. Creo que, que son buenos elemento, elementos diversificadores en, en las carteras de los clientes y, y actualmente de hecho tenemos una apuesta bastante clara por, por ellos. O sea que en términos de, de asset allocation, eh, por darte un porcentaje podríamos hablar de, de una allocation en torno al 5% en, o 10% en materias primas y dentro de las mismas, pues como, como estamos ahora hablando, yo creo que, el, que las materias, los metales preciosos juegan un rol especialmente importante. Eh, quizá el, el, probablemente la característica más, más interesante sea el elemento de diversificación, pero estoy seguro que, que además de, de este digamos, aspecto positivo que, que en cualquier portfolio eh, aportan, eh, Netos va a contar con todo el detalle porque es interesante invertir ahora mismo en este momento del ciclo económico en, en estos, eh, este asset y además cómo hacerlo, porque evidentemente se puede hacer de distintas formas. Se puede hacer de forma directa o de forma indirecta a través de compañías. ¿no? Muchas gracias, José María. Parece que tenemos a Ned de vuelta. ¿Es así? ¿Ned? I, I hope so. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. We can. Very clear. <laughs> clear and loud and uh, hope uh, the technical issues are, are over. Uh, I was just uh, making a brief introduction, and uh, I don't know if you managed to uh, to listen to that. But uh, I had just finished uh, passing the word to you. Uh, we are also we are already running uh, a bit late, so uh, please, uh, Ned, the stage is yours. Thank you. That's fantastic. Thank you, everybody. Apologies. Um, also, the. Felix has embarrassed me by telling you that I studied Spanish, but I'm not going to present in Castellano. So this is um, already going badly. Um, but let's go to the first slide, please. Brilliant. Um, so I think it's very important to just for a moment um, discuss what gold and silver really are and what they're not because um, often people associate gold and silver with commodity markets. Now, while they are mined, so like copper and um, you know, zinc, etc., they are mined, they are actually foreign exchange instruments, which is why we talk about monetary metals. Now, the Central Bank of Spain um, has a lower gold reserve than the rest of the Eurozone, uh, Portugal has a higher one, but all of these central banks hold gold because it is the actual risk-free form of money. Uh, this used to be formally the case, uh, as in not um, in the past. I mean, formally, as in it's, it, was, it was actually held as the risk-free instrument. And uh, interestingly, with the advent of Basel III regulations, which come fully into place at the beginning of next year, Gold is going to be treated once more as a fully unencumbered risk free instrument again. And I think that's extremely important in terms of a signal of the intentions of the G20, the central banks themselves and the direction of what we may even be using as money again in the future. But just have a look there at the central bank gold holdings. Uh, you know, we're not looking at a situation where major central banks hold over two thirds of their reserves in gold because it's a tradition. They do it because it doesn't require a credit rating, unlike US treasuries. And with the issuance, obviously, of, um, of government bonds at, let's say, very obviously unsustainable rates, the role of gold as a sterilizer of monetary risk and potentially indeed as a fire extinguisher for the, uh, the government bond market at some point in the next few years, the importance of it in a portfolio is just starting to become more obvious to people. Now, silver, as Felix, I heard him uh, talk about, is, is, a, is a bit different because it has, um, at the moment, some narrative which gold does not have. No one's interested in gold at the moment at all. 
Um, that's because the market is focused on rate hikes, which personally I'm, I'm dubious about, but that's fine. That's where the bond market's focus is at the moment. Silver, however, carries a bit of narrative because of the, the fiscal programs, the, um, the green tech uh, and, and um, electrification angle of silver usage. But the real um, importance of silver is, is the fact that you have two forms of growing demand. So one being the obvious one, which is, as we've just said, industry, but the other being the one that can grow much more quickly, which is investment demand. Now in January of this year, we saw a, a short period where this showed up as a genuine phenomenon in markets. The silver price didn't quite get through $30 an ounce. Um, when it does next time, I anticipate we could start to go up a lot very quickly. Uh, and if we go ahead to the next couple of slides, I'll show you a bit more about that in a minute. But let's go to the next slide, please. So this is um, how I like to think about gold, which is gold is just gold. It stays at 100. It measures services and it doesn't really even have a price. What it's doing is measuring the relative loss of purchasing power of sovereign currencies. And that's why central banks have large amounts of it. it there is a book called The Golden Constant. I don't think there's a Spanish translation of it. Uh, it's pretty dry and boring in English, let alone in Spanish. But mind you, having said that, you know, I had to read Don Quixote in Spanish, so maybe you should read this in English. Um, but, but what I'm trying to show you here is that Effectively, government-issued money goes down the stairs like a slinky, one of those children's toys. And right now, we're about to fall off a very important step in the global monetary system, which will lead, I think, to much higher gold and silver prices. Let's go to the next slide, please. Uh, this is a bit, um, uh, we say in English, sizzly, you know, it's a sort of exciting slide, but, you know, I'm trying to show you um, what I think will really happen, which is that silver really doesn't do very much until it does an enormous amount very quickly. And I feel that some point in the next 12 to 18 months, it could be very soon, that we will get a very big move for silver. Uh, now, in 1980, adjusted for inflation, this chart, by the way, is quarterly, so it doesn't capture uh, daily or weekly data. Um, silver actually hit in today's money $170 an ounce in 1980. It's currently $26 an ounce. And back then there was a lot of silver around. Much more, there is a lot of credit money around and very, very little silver. Indeed, the biggest silver ETF in the world reported in January, well, changed its prospectus in January to take account for the fact that there is no silver in size available to add to that ETF. So we go through $30 an ounce, I think we're gonna hit one of these big moves. Like the last one was in 2011, silver went to 50. Um, I think we'll go a lot higher than 50 this time. Now, when it happens, I'm not sure, but we do already have rising industrial demand and rising investment demand. And those two things together have um, created a very powerful cocktail for the silver market, particularly as these forms of investment are um, unleveraged. So we're not really talking about futures market, you know, margin trading. We're talking about fully paid cash investors in the metal uh, for hedging purposes. And that's a much more powerful dynamic to sustain much higher silver prices. Uh, let's keep going. I'm aware we're short of time, so I won't carry on too long. This is, I suppose, the, the proof of what it is that moves the gold price and the silver price, which is real interest rates, tasa reales. Um, what we have at the top is the US dollar gold price and US dollar seven to 10 year real interest rates. And at the bottom, sterling gold and sterling real interest rates. So mirror for euro gold and euro seven to 10 year real rates but I don't have an index available to me in Bloomberg of seven to 10 year euro real rates. So I can't show that for you, but it's important to understand that this is true everywhere. So Hungarian forint gold 
will look the, the opposite of Hungarian foreign real rates as well. It's because your your local cash market is is always wanting to to make a choice between holding gold long or holding the local currency long, and they are just the opposite of each other. So if your local currency looks ropey looking forwards, then gold will be going up in your currency, and that's exactly why gold has gone down in the last few weeks. Um, and it's simply because dollars, um, euros less so, but dollars in particular look slightly better held forward than they did a few weeks ago due to the market becoming a bit more hawkish. Um, and that's how this all plays out. Now, I will say, though, just look at the US dollar gold price chart at the top. The axis on the right shows you the dark line at minus one. I just want to clarify what that means. That means that the total global bond market's view of one dollar held seven to ten years out net of rates and inflation expectations will still buy you 99 cents of goods and services. Now, I find that amazing. I can't think there's almost ever been something so mispriced as that. The idea that the dollar will buy you 99 cents of goods and services in 10 years is just crazy. But it's a function of the relationship between the bond market and the Fed. You know, no vigilantism. Uh, it's it's a it's a, a Faustian plot between the bond market and the central bank, and they're not properly taking account of what's happening in the real world. Now, people can say inflation is transitory, and I think there may be some truth to that in terms of the supply chain. What I see happening here is we have a huge problem. Uh, assets are in limited supply. Money is in unlimited supply, and we're starting to see a genuine flow from one to the other. And for me, this is now set, and it's only going to continue. Let's carry on. Uh, and you can express this trade many ways. Most people just buy gold, but remember that gold is just the risk-free instrument. It's cash. Now, that's fine, but in order to attribution in a portfolio, you need a lot of that. So what we offer in our fund is two ways to add beta to that. Now, at the moment, the beta is not that high. It's only about you know, 1.6, 1.8 times in silver versus gold and gold miners versus gold. But this can trend massively to the right. So we can totally see a situation in the future where gold miners are uh, delivering four or five X the gold price. And likewise, silver can deliver an extreme beta outcome relative to gold. If we go into a squeeze environment like we saw in 2011 or even more so in 19, 1980. Uh, so I think we have one more slide and then I shall pass back. And this is just our asset allocation model. So one thing about our fund is that we, we're not static and we also like to use bullion and silver miners in large quantities. We have a one uh, um, attacking asset allocation model, which is where we are at the moment over on the left. It's a minimum 15 in bullion. Um, at the moment, we have 18% in bullion. And we're equally split between gold and silver miners. And that mining exposure, we keep to the Americas and Australia. So no Africa, no Russia, so Central Asia. We don't think that you're, you're compensated on a risk-adjusted basis for being in those countries. So we keep our focus nice and narrow. With that, I should definitely hand back um, to the studio. Thank you very much, Ned. Uh, very interesting and very, uh, I mean, just in time. Thank you for that. And now I would like to, um, uh, to move uh, to our panelists uh, and uh, to see whether uh, they have some um, questions uh, about uh, the gold and silver market, the uh, macro environment uh, for the monetary metals, uh, the fund in particular, or uh, any other subject that they deem uh, interesting. So uh, maybe we can uh, start with um, you, Alvaro. Sure. Uh, do you hear me? Do you very hear well. me? Okay. Yes. Okay, nice. Um, thank you very much, Ned, for your uh, presentation. It's been very uh, illustrative. And uh, nowadays, uh, talking about uh, commodities and gold and silver, it's on um, everybody's uh, investment asset allocation views. So um, 
So I would like to kick off the, uh, the questions um, asking you a very basic one, uh, which you have already uh, said or talked a little bit on your first slide. Um, it's about what are the, what, what is your view about the differences between gold and silver? Because you mentioned that um, uh, there are a few differences, uh, basically, for example, talking about silver, the industrial demand of the silver against the gold uh, being more uh, a cash oriented uh, investment for uh, central banks, governments and, and portfolios. But uh, I was thinking also on, um, on, for example, the demand of gold in Asia, especially in those countries that um, people, I mean, the common, the regular people is buying gold for, uh, for um, accounting wealth uh, within their uh, uh, households or uh, within their um, families. And, and, and also um, um, you've mentioned uh, the uh, financial side of the differences between gold and silver. Um, but could you give us some more um, uh, um, views about uh, investors investing in gold and silver, the differences and the macro underlines that I could drive prices of both uh, asset classes? Sure. Um, so I think the key thing to point out is that there are different um, there are different demand components in silver as compared to gold, but the price discovery mechanism is the same. So they 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 both trade as as, as physical. So if you're talking about um, uh, Indian jewelry demand for gold, and then we talk about industrial demand for silver. Both of these exist in the physical component of the overall market for gold and silver. And the physical market for gold and silver probably makes up around three, four turnover. Because gold and silver both trade as physical, as futures and options, and FX. And FX uh, market exposure is easily the largest of these. So in terms of what drives the price, it's this real interest rate function. It's the, it's the foreign exchange market and the real interest rate tailwind or headwind that drives the, the underlying price. Um, I would just point out as well that, that, that while you're right that people hold gold all over Asia, for example, as um, their, their primary savings vehicle, they also do that with silver. It's just the poorer people. Um, so, in fact, the, the purchasing of silver jewellery in India in the last three or four years has really grown hugely due to the expensive nature of gold jewellery and dowries. Um, a lot of Indians now use silver jewellery instead of that because they just can't access the gold market. Um, it's too expensive for them. So, so, you know, that's a very important insight as to what one of the differences between the two things are, which is price point, therefore accessibility. Um, now, it's also true that the word plata, uh, argent, um, uh, yuan, shekel, you know, these all, all remind one that silver is actually the greater monetary metal of history than gold. It's the one that we've really used as money. You know, gold is the while yes, there are rich people who hold gold as um, as money, through history, people have used silver even more. And, and the thing to understand is that really the big difference is liquidity. Silver is a much smaller market than gold, and there is much less of it around. So that means that it has much greater potential for a squeeze. And as I showed you before, we've seen that twice, and I think we'll see it again. Thanks a lot, Ned. Um, Jose Maria, um, do you have some questions yes. for, yes, uh, Ned. for Ned? I, I, sure, I was, I was going to ask you now, talking about silver and, and you mentioned the squeeze. Can you be, can you be, a, be a bit more detailed and tell us exactly or explain the silver squeeze that happened at the beginning of the year? I mean, do you think that this is a one-off event? So, so I, I, I don't know. I think it's, um, it, that was just the very first sighting of something much more important, um, which is silver is the, is the, I think, as you know, the, the, the populist uh, metal. 
So gold, gold is very important. It's central bank money. It's, it has all sorts of functions. But silver is more of a populist instrument. And what we saw in January was a brief period of where the populist move in GameStop bled across into the silver market, where some people started to understand the nature of the silver market in a way that they didn't understand it before, which is that the banking system, the banking system is structurally short. By the way, I mean the commercial banking system, not the central banks. The commercial banking system is um, structurally short both metals. But the difference is that in gold, because there is abundant available gold, they should be able to make the gold market clear no matter what. It might need substantially higher prices, but the gold market should clear. Whereas with silver, because there is no silver around, and we saw that there was nothing, that if the market starts to run at silver and say, I want silver. So the populist investors, rather than going long a hedge fund short, start to say, I just want to own physical silver. I want to own, let's say two, three, you know, see a very uncontrolled silver price because industry has to have the stuff. They can't build anything without it. You can't, you can't do these electric cars. You can't even use the screens that today aren't working so well. Um, blame that on the silver. You know, none of this can happen without silver. And so it, they have to have silver, whatever price is required to, to clear the silver market. So I think what we saw was the first manifestation of a very important trend, which will reappear at some point. And I think it will simply take silver trading above $30 an ounce to see it reappear. And then we could go straight up from there. Frankly, that's what I think will happen. Thank you. Thank you, Ned. Uh, Alvaro, uh, do you have any other comments or questions for Ned? Sure. Uh, thank you, Felix. Um, uh, Ned, uh, your fund and your strategy um, invest not only in um, bullion, but also in gold and silver miners. Why do you differentiate both kind of investments first? And um, can you also uh, add on top, what are your views or your outlook about the miners where you invest in? Yeah, um, so look, gold miners have been disappointing for all our careers, as, as both of you know very well. Um, you know, they have really struggled to deliver um, consistent free cash flow growth. And that's due to a problem, a structural problem they've had with costs. And silver miners, frankly, have been slightly worse than gold miners. But what they are is a form of um, synthetic, a form of synthetic open-ended call option on what we've been discussing. So the way that we think about it is we want the silver miners in there because they have far greater optionality due to the potential for a squeeze. They can add a lot. They have a lot of um, of, un, of unpriced and open ended upside uh, should silver start to gap and start to go up through 50 up towards $100, which I think is very, very possible. Um, so it's a way the, the reason we like both is because we want to access that uh, additional optionality. Now, it means you've got to have a balance within the portfolio, and that's also why we own bullion. Um, but in terms of my outlook, I think, you know, I would just say, look at the last 12 months. So while gold and silver miners have been disappointing in our career and they have failed to deliver performance that's substantially better than the underlying gold and silver price, actually, if you look in the last 12 months, it's quite different. You're starting to see quarter on quarter positive free cash flow and growth in that free cash flow. Now, this is a new environment. I'm, I, we've not seen it, frankly. I, I tend to think it's no coincidence that we've only seen it now when the monetary system is starting to unbuckle um i find that rather poetic that you know people like me have been investing in these things for a long time and they haven't really worked but now that the the underlying behavior at central bank level has got completely um well it's like the twilight zone now isn't it uh, it's no coincidence that as you see that suddenly these gold miners which are mining 
uh, sound money, they are actually delivering uh, earnings growth through cash flow growth. And so long as we don't get a genuine commodity super cycle, which we are not in, this is a monetary super cycle. This is not a demand led commodity super cycle. Um, so long as we don't get that, they should be able to deliver consistent margin expansion because there, there is no real squeeze there in terms of people, services and equipment. When you get that, it becomes quite difficult for the companies to actually uh, deliver um, margin expansion and rising earnings due to cost uh, pressures. Thank you. Jose Maria? Uh, yes, Felix, I would like to ask uh, something. Um, I think that nowadays um, there is no discussion where ESG is on the table. So I would like to ask you about ESG factors or ESG investing uh, and the relation with uh, with the strategy and the fund. So what what role do ESG factors play in, in the fund or in the strategy? Yeah, excellent question. Um, it's 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 fully integrated, but also, uh, you know, frankly, I think that there's a problem with the sustainability and monetary system. So I think that there's an integrated point here about what is and isn't sustainable in the monetary system. But in terms of my portfolio, um, the first observation to make is that silver mining is absolutely vital to transition towards a zero carbon economy. You're gonna to have to have a lot more silver, a lot more. This isn't um, optional, it can't happen without that. So the first thing we have to say is, this is very important to everybody else's idea of, of transitioning to an alternative energy source um, reality. So, you know, unless we're gonna start growing silver on trees, it's gonna come out of the ground. So therefore dealing with how are we doing this head on and grappling with it is very important. Now, we slightly avoid that because we only invest in the Americas and Australia. And now there are places where silver is mined that, we, that we're not involved with, therefore we can't um, participate in the ESG conversation with those companies, for example, in Russia. But the, the greater proportion of silver production comes from the Americas. And we have both an ESG charter, but also towards all three components. And most importantly for us, actually the social license, because it, you know, in a, in a gold and silver mining company, if you're not on top of the social license, so if um, a company has promised to build a bridge in Guatemala and they don't build it, then you can end up with a blockade and you can lose 30 to 100% of your investment pretty quickly. So there is both an investment led reason to be on top of it, but also a holistic need to think about this problem um, and deal with it front on, because we're gonna need the silver to drive both uh, the electrification of the global economy and all these alternative energy sources, and frankly, the digitization of the global economy. So um, it's an all-in conversation. We're, we're very activist. And, and you know, in countries like Peru, for example, where they may have, you know, let's say, a political environment that people are a bit worried about at the moment, actually, you know, on the mining level and on an ESG level, all of this is very well understood because that's a country that is um, very well developed in terms of mining. You know, everything is there in order to be able to manage ESG factors in the same way that if you went and invested in Russia or Kazakhstan, it's very difficult to be on top of the, the problem. Okay. Very interesting, Ned. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Alvaro, uh, Jose Maria, I don't know if you have uh, any... Well, actually, questions. yeah. Felix, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Do you hear me? Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. One, one uh, more question, Ned. Um, the uh, cryptocurrencies are becoming very popular nowadays. Um, we've seen these, um, these going up and down in prices uh, every week. 
and um, everybody just looking at cryptocurrencies. Um, mm, I have a clear idea of the differences between both and the, um, the way the prices are um, determined in, in the markets. Um, but um, how would you differentiate gold and silver against the, uh, the cryptocurrencies for, uh, for common investors and for the investment community? So nowadays they're very different. They weren't initially. So Bitcoin and and gold. So Bitcoin was designed to be digital gold, and you know that, that therefore it comes from the same idea that that gold and silver have, which is you don't need you don't need third parties like banks and governments when thinking about money. So that's that's the similarity. Is the philosophy. Um, but I would, I would, first thing I would say is they're not cryptocurrencies, they're crypto assets. I think that the, the, na the, the naming of it is important. And at the moment, it's not right because they're not currencies, they're assets. Now, whether they have merit or not, it, I think has to be considered on an individual case basis. Um, but, you know, I'm never short of an opinion. And I'll, I will tell you that right now, I think that they're pretty much, pretty much done uh, for now. Now, that's not to say that the revolution isn't here to stay because it is but i think that the i think the bitcoin was your was your we say in england stabilizer wheels on on a on a child's bicycle the little wheels that you put on the bicycle that's what bitcoin was it was to educate the public about the new central bank digital currency system which is coming which will be the opposite of cryptocurrencies because it will be fully lit and centralized. So everything you do will be tracked and monitored. It couldn't be less like Bitcoin. You know, it's not gonna be anonymous um, and it's all going to be state led. So I just feel at the moment that we've passed that original um, excitement, the, 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 the pricing bubble I feel is, is pretty much cooked now, uh, but the future for me, is, is the blending of gold, which will uh, consume the debt obligations, reprice the system, um, state money, and then, and then um, crypto asset tokens and, and, and um, solutions off your phone, which will be how we will run finances, banking, et cetera, in the future. Thanks. Thank you, Ned. Do, do we have time for, for another one, Felix? Yeah, we do. Go ahead, Jose Maria. Yeah, okay, great. So, Ned, um, let's uh, change gears. I was going to ask you about portfolio construction. So, what is, in your view, the role of these metals in a portfolio? Uh, what, what are the benefits of adding both in a portfolio? So the, the, the truth is that you, we can talk about what you will know very well, which is that on a backward looking basis, gold on its own has a clear diversifying effect on portfolios. So if you say two to 5% over the last 50 years, it has a clear decorrelating and genuinely diversifying effect on portfolios. Now in a world where everything is correlated and there is no diversification, that is powerful and important. However, it doesn't have much attribution. You know, if you actually look at the maths of it, that, and, and, and the other problem is, for me, someone that's interested in cycles, um, I don't like backward looking observations, because I don't think they have that much real value and utility. I know people rely on them. But that's not how things work. So, so, so my answer to your question is, is you want to use that backward looking data, which suggests a two to 5% allocation is a good number. But you want to use it and you want to invest in the mining stocks because what they deliver is the optionality that will actually deliver proper attribution and hedging in an overall portfolio when it's needed. Now, we haven't really seen it in my career, uh, but with what's you know, there in central bank level, I think that will happen. I think that will happen. So that's why we run our fund the way we do it. Okay. Okay, but um, related to that, 
Uh, well, I'm glad to hear that because when we, when we lost the connection at the beginning, <laughs> I was talking about this particular um, attribute, which is uh, diversification. But I was going to ask you precisely about that, uh, whether it is better to invest via bullion or better to invest via stocks. And what is the difference between both? Well, we know that you have an additional risk, which is an operating risk when you're investing in, in shares. But is this something that you take into account, obviously, when you are building the portfolio and changing the weights between bullion and shares? I guess you do, but so, if you can explain that briefly. Yeah, so so gold miners are inherently risky at the operating level. You're absolutely right. But mm -hmm. gold on its own, to deliver the real what you need it for, you would want like 20% of your portfolio in it. And no one's going to do that. You know, it's not, we, we don't live in a world, like when I started my career, you could do that actually. And, and, and in fact, I did do that for clients, but you can't do that now. So I think you have to accept the operating risks of the mining companies is part of the story. But when you diversify across, we have 43 names in our portfolio. What you're doing there is you're reducing the individual uh, mining level operating risks. Why Australia is because they, they, they manage these risks better. You know, they're, they're more, you know, control. Now, in terms of the, the way we allocate, that isn't decided based on anything other than a momentum signal. So I don't decide that. That is decided by um, weight of money and momentum in the market. So if, if that starts to go powerfully negative, on a, on a medium to long term basis, then we shift across and go more defensive in the model. But I, I, you know, it's not that doesn't directly tie into the question of operating risk in mining. Thank you, Ned. Um, I think we have some questions from the audience. Uh, right. So maybe uh, Elena. Yes. Uh, thank you, Ned. It was Super interesting. And so, yeah, we have several questions uh, from the audience. Most of them, you already covered them, but I think we have time to, uh, to ask you a few of them. So the first one is, what is the role of gold and silver in a fully digital monetary system? And do you see a new Bretton Woods model possible? How would you envision it? Yes. Well, lovely question. That sounds like I wrote the question. Um, so, um, look, I think that it, it's important to understand that central banks like gold. So there's a, there's a belief out there that they don't, you know, that they hate gold and it's their enemy. Well, that's just not true. You know, they, they, that's why they hold two thirds of their reserves in gold is they understand what risk free is and they understand what, what, credit is and they understand lots of things better than all of us do put together. Um, so when they think about a new bread and woods and they think about how money works, they're always going to be considering these complex and quite hidden factors uh, in designing a new system. Now, history tells you that when you stretch the monetary elastic band too far and it snaps, you have to go back to a sound, solid form of money, i.e. gold, initially. So what I see happening is quite simple, really, which is that we will have a reset. It will involve um, a form of jubilee, which means um, the, the taking the red pen out of government debt. Uh, so we'll have a debt jubilee. Gold will reprice credit money. And then we will be delivered that in the form of a digital token. So we will have a new type of Bretton Woods arrangement. Bear in mind that the only reason we don't have it anyway is because the Americans forced everybody off it in 1971 at the barrel of a gun. So no one agreed to this, what we have now. What happened was the Americans forced it on the world. They just turned around and said, no gold, not doing that anymore you're just getting dollars. And we're now back at the point where after 2008, the G20 
So just to clarify, this Basel III thing is really important. After 2008, the G20 came together and said, right, we need to reform the banking system. And what the most important thing they did is, is, is change how gold is treated in the banking system as a risk-free instrument. Now, it's funny we talk about this today because the rules that were written in, well, I think it was 2010, actually, um, are now finally going to come in in January 2022. So that's how long it has taken to get the banks to, um, well, they've just been lobbying constantly to stop any of this coming in. But, but last, this Monday, the line in the sand was drawn completely, and it is now coming in in six months' time. Now, what that tells me is the central banks themselves are ready to return gold to its natural role in the monetary system uh, because they will know what the implications are. If you put, if you formally put gold alongside US treasuries and treat them the same, everybody will choose gold. So I, I think we're right at the cusp of a return to a Bretton Woods like arrangement. It will be a blend of government issued money, um, uh, blockchain, if you want to call it that, and, and gold. Um, another question. Um, will the green economy split the relationship between dollar and oil? Well, that's a, that's a very interesting question. Um, I think it's, it's a point to, to make, which is that if you take people's reliance off oil, um, then that petrodollar relationship between, um, you know, the Middle East. Russia, which powerful factors at work anyway, that's that are altering this away from the dollar namely these banking reforms and the, the, the de-dollarization process that we've seen rolling out over the last 10 years anyway. Um, so, so yes, I think that definitely does, it, it strengthens the move away from the petrodollar system, yes. I think we have time for another one. Um... Could you please elaborate a bit more on the implications of Basel III on the price of, uh, of prices, uh, precious metals? Okay, so um, the, the bullion banks, the big global banks that trade FX gold, or rather sell FX gold to their customers in huge quantities, this is unallocated gold. We don't know. We don't know how much. They don't tell us. It's all very you know, under the table. Um, but changed by by Basel III um, regulations. In other words, they are going to have to allocate those positions or close them out. Now, all of this obviously means where's the gold? You know, how are you going to do that? Now, I don't know what exactly how this will roll out or whether we will see um, this affect prices in the second half of the year as you thought would have thought it would do because it doesn't come in until January but it is now it is now a done deal um, or whether we have to wait until next year before we see the effect but basically it means they've either got to close out those positions force people to sell their gold positions now of course if you do that what you're doing is you are putting the Jolly Roger flag. You're telling the customers that you don't have any gold. So that's going to make them motivated to find the real gold and start bidding up physical gold. So how, how I can't see how this doesn't involve a repricing event for the gold price because it, it basically turns synthetic gold ownership into physical gold ownership. Uh, and this is why I've mentioned it several times today, because it is extremely uh, important. Thank you, Neda. I think we have um, two minutes left for a final question. Uh, I would like to ask you, related to the previous uh, uh, response, if you think, after what you were saying about that new regime, that the US dollar role 
uh, uh, until now um, has its days counted if, if it's going to end anytime soon on your in, in your opinion I think that the US dollar's role is is in is in supporting the existing commercial banking system now while while we don't have a financial crisis so I'll just be very clear I don't mean an economic crisis or a medical crisis I mean a fin financial crisis then I, I would anticipate the dollar will pretty much remain um, the, the primary um, safety first function of the banking system. But if because of these regulatory changes, you see a scramble for gold that will have to become public, it won't be possible to keep it quiet because it's a global price, you know, people will see what's happening, then very quickly, in my view, people will remember the difference between credit money, which has a credit rating, and real money, which has no credit rating. So it's a difficult one to directly answer, Felix, but I think that, um, you know, the next six to 12 months will, will, will tell us a lot, really, about where this is going. Thank you very much, Ned. So I think... Uh... I think that yeah, That's we're it. out of uh, out of time. Uh, Ned, thank you very much. It was really nice to see you again, and I hope I'll see you uh, you know in one of your great presentations in in the Americas in in Latin America, and maybe we can even have a drink together. <laughs> but as, I, I as look always, to very much in that. <laughs> but as always, it's is great just uh, to listen to you. So thank you very much. Muchísimas gracias. Eh, quiero dar también las gracias a, a, a Álvaro y a José María. Gracias por estar con nosotros. Eh, y por supuesto a Félix y a, y a Júpiter por hacer posible este evento. Y antes de despedirnos, solamente quiero recordar a nuestros oyentes que, que está disponible el cuestionario en la página web de, de EFPA para, para la hora de, de, de formación. Y poco más. Eh, gracias, Félix. Eh, gracias, Júpiter. Y nos vemos pronto en otro Virtual Investment Summit. Gracias a vosotros y a, y a, toda, a toda la audiencia. Muchísimas gracias. Buenas tardes. Hasta luego. Gracias.